Have you seen truck prices lately? Today's new truck costs about what you could buy a starter home for just a few years ago. The average truck payment is almost $900 a month. That's the average payment. Why is this happening? Well, it's mostly due to demand because the pickup truck has become the new sports car, the new family station wagon, the new workhorse, the new luxury vehicle. It's become the Swiss army knife of personal transport. And all of this demand is causing subsequently higher prices. To get around this problem of high truck prices, many are looking at used trucks. But this is no guaranteed bargain, as you're usually getting an older truck with nearly 100,000 miles on it that still requires a $500 monthly payment. Who knows what the service history was or what problems that you're likely to inherit. And while consumer inflation has come down over the past year, these prices are likely to remain sticky and elevated until the next deflationary crash, whenever that is. It could take years. So what's the solution? I personally want to get off of this never-ending treadmill of always chasing the latest thing and having monthly payments for the rest of my life until I assume room temperature. So here's what I'm going to do about it. First off, start by finding something that you really, really like and you can stand to be with for the next couple of decades. Treat it like a house. Squeeze every ounce of utility and depreciation that you can out of it. If I can get 300,000 miles out of my F-150 power boost, then I've beat the system. Hey, if it works for Warren Buffett, it can work for me too. Who's a jammy bastard? I know you're saying 300,000 miles out of a Ford F-150 power boost. Have I lost my mind? Everybody knows you can get that out of a Honda or a Toyota or a Mercedes diesel, but a Ford F-150 with an incredibly complex hybrid powertrain? Well, I believe that I can do it. Here's my 10 step plan on how I intend to get 300,000 miles out of this truck and how you can too. Okay, here we go with step one. And I hate to be crude here, but it has to be said, don't polish a turd. What this means is if you haven't really taken care of the truck or if it's had a bad service history, you can't wish your way to 300,000 miles unless you're starting with the right vehicle. Before you go through the effort of trying to get 300,000 miles out of a vehicle or whatever your goal is, ask yourself these questions. Has this vehicle been taken care of through its entire lifespan? Does this vehicle have structural issues? Has it been in a crash? Does it have structural rust? Not just surface rust, but actual structural rust where it's affecting the integrity of the frame. Does the engine use oil? Does it use coolant? If so, it may have some deeper issues. You may have to replace that engine down the line. Always start with the very best platform that you can, as it's very hard to overcome legacy structural or internal engine issues without turning it into a money pit. You cannot undo lack of maintenance by starting to maintain it later on. The damage has been done and it will eventually catch up with you. So ask yourself, is this the one? Have the truck earn your trust by demonstrated reliable performance. If it's still a good candidate and is the one for you, then proceed. Is this the one? Is this the one? Oh yeah, this is the one, definitely. My 2022 Ford F-150 Power Boost has been flawless over 17,000 miles and has exceeded my expectations. I could see driving this for another 20 years. All right, step number two to get to 300,000 miles. If you live in the salt belt, I didn't even know this term existed, but the salt belt are those states in the U.S. that are outlined in red that use salt on the roads during the winter to control ice. Now, this also is the same for Canadian provinces, especially the lower end of the province where the temperatures don't get too cold and salt can actually work on the roads. So for you Canadians up there, you're part of the salt belt as well, depending on where you live. You can maintain your engine to run like a Swiss watch 
but if you let the frame rot from rust, it just won't matter. Late model F-150s have aluminum body components, so they won't rust. However, the frame and drivetrain components are steel. They're not well protected from salt and corrosion. Rust and structural damage can be a huge issue if you live in areas that use salt in the wintertime and you don't protect it. Also, what I found was proximity to coastal areas can also cause a lot of oxidation and rust over time as well. If you allow spray from the sea to get on your truck, sometimes it can be based on where you park your car around the coast. One side of the truck can get nailed, the other side's totally fine. So just because you're around a coastal area doesn't mean that you're immune from this. If you're in one of those areas, then you must undercoat your vehicle and maintain that undercoating on a regular basis. What I would do is visit the Project Farm video link in the info section of this video. This guy did a very comprehensive comparison test on several popular undercoating products. While anything is better than nothing, there were some clear winners for your consideration. Check it out. If you are not in one of those areas affected by road or coastline salt, you should be able to limit any corrosion to just surface rust and structural rust should not be a concern. Here's a pretty typical example of surface rust on the differential of a brand new truck. I believe my truck was about two weeks old when I received it in this condition. And this was really easy to rectify with a little bit of cleaning work, a little bit of wire brushing and some undercoating on here. So this is pretty typical surface rust this is not gonna cause a problem. I operated to maintain several vehicles past 200,000 miles from new, and the engines ran like new based on my maintenance regimen, but what ultimately killed them was road salt destroying the frame. All right, we started with the right vehicle and we have kept the frame rust free. So we've got a great platform to be able to put extended mileage on a vehicle and beat this system. So. Step number three has got to be the engine oil. Well, you knew this one was coming. There is no more polarizing subject on the topic of automotive maintenance than oil. I see it all the time in forums, on subreddits, on Twitter threads, dinosaur oil versus synthetic versus semi-synthetic. We argue about the change frequency and the mileage when we should do that. We argue about brand religion. We create these incredibly long threads on whether we should follow the truck's oil monitor or not. Oh, and of course, the recommended maintenance intervals. If you can argue about anything, people will argue about oil. So regardless of all the opinions floating around the internet, I do have some facts that I want to share with you. Fact, there is no more important metric to the longevity of your engine than the ongoing quality of the oil circulating in your engine. The average quality of the oil in your crankcase over time effectively determines the engine life. That is a fact. Fact number two, new oil is better than used oil. Soot accumulates in the oil, anti-wear additives break down, fuel dilution occurs, acid builds up, oil simply gets worse the more you use it. That is a fact. If it were feasible, we'd replace the oil every day with the slightest contamination and the engine would outlast all of us. And that would be impractical and far too expensive. So what we're after here is a balance. We want the maximum possible service life of the engine while also trying to make it economically feasible to operate. Sounds fair to me. So I just have two simple suggestions to follow with respect to oil to get the maximum life out of your engine without excessive cost. Number one, use the best synthetic oil that you can buy. The brand probably matters a lot less than you think if you don't run extended service levels. So check this info section of this video for a link to an objective oil test series by Project Farm YouTube channel. Myself, personally, I've used Mobile One Extended Performance for over 30 years. I suppose it was not called Extended Performance 30 years ago, but either way, I've used their best oil for 30 years. I have well over 1 million accumulated miles across several vehicles 
without any performance degradation, no burning, no smoking, no oil use, no nothing. They all ran like new, even after 200,000 miles. Due to the Project Farm test results, I have switched over to Pennzoil Ultra Platinum and or Amsoil Signature Series. Those were the two best in the comparison. Suggestion number two, if you're running an EcoBoost engine, then your change interval should be 5,000 miles. Now, this is not a suggestion that I just pulled out of my digestive tract. I got this based on a lot of suggestions from actual Ford Pro mechanics. Check the info section of this video for links to these expert Ford mechanics and their recommendations on oil change intervals and why the EcoBoost engine is particularly hard on engine oil. In addition, every couple of oil changes, I'm gonna be sending off an oil sample of it to Blackstone to analyze for wear and other trends. It's cheap insurance. Anyway, that's what I'm gonna do with the respect to oil in my engine in my quest to get to 300,000 miles. Let me know in the comments below if you have a better plan. Now, the next logical step towards keeping this truck for over 300,000 miles has got to be just the regular maintenance of this. As Chuck Yeager so famously said, never wait for trouble. Perhaps this is overkill, but I think that Ford waits far too long for some regular maintenance items in their schedule. We already covered the oil changes, which they recommend at 10,000 miles. We're doing in half that. But waiting until 150,000 before servicing the transmission and doing a differential fluid change, that's way too far out. And waiting until 200,000 before changing coolant, that again is a bit of a stretch. I think those service levels are too far out to me. I will likely cut those at least in half. Fluids are cheap, rebuilds are expensive. And this is not just me saying this, but rather master mechanics that work on these trucks every single day. Look for the reference links to specific YouTube videos that cover this topic in the info section of this video. And that brings us to the number five way that I'd like to extend the life of my truck, which is through an oil catch can. Once again, here's another polarizing topic, oil catch cans. You either see the value in them or you think they're a waste of money. The purpose of them is to catch water-based oil vapor before it can be recirculated back into the intake. Would you intentionally dump this cup of oily crap back into your intake manifold? Probably not purposely. With port-based injection, this is not that much of an issue anymore. But personally, I'd like to keep that junk out of the intake and the oil separator will help. The only brand I'm aware of that makes this, there may be others, but this is the one I'm aware of, which is the J&L oil separator. It's a pretty simple installation and $160 for the kit. It's a reasonable way to keep those oil vapors out of your intake. One more way to prevent the intake passages from getting fouled. There is an Amazon link for the Power Boost kit in the video description below. If we look for very small improvements across the board, the aggregate effect of all these will add up. Step number six to keep my truck running for a long time is to keep the rodents at bay. Rodents can't get enough of Ford soy coated wiring. That is a big problem. I've heard of a lot of people, even some trucks that were sitting in the Ford lot were hit by this issue by rodents chewing the wiring. So chewed wiring creates intermittent issues that are super hard to diagnose for even the most experienced technician. They create intermittence and those things are just devils to find. The best prevention is to park inside a tightly sealed garage and keep the critters away from your truck. If you can't park inside like me, pop your hood with every fill up just like the old times, right? Check your oil, get in there and look for nesting. Any kind of chewing, get ahead of this issue before it becomes a problem down the road. Don't let your truck sit in one spot for too long. This will attract rodents that think they've got a new home. If you see evidence of rodent activity, use traps near the vehicle overnight. Peppermint oil sprayed on the wiring supposedly repels 
rodents. I have not tried this. Or just live in an area like mine with tons of predator birds that put rodents at the bottom of the food chain. Step number seven to making your truck last a long time is to get a service manual and the best OBD2 monitor you can buy. When I first started working on cars, the first thing I would do was to pick up a Chilton or a Haynes repair manual. They were great, they are well illustrated, they made every procedure very simple to follow. But I, I don't think those are in print yet for late model Ford pickups, and when they are, I would imagine that they're gonna be limited in scope, not covering all of the complex software systems and procedures in the latest trucks. This is why you should go to factorymanuals.com and you can basically put in your VIN and get a custom manual for your exact truck. You provide your VIN, it will compile a vehicle specific service manual, including your extended warranty if you have one. I've heard that these are several thousand pages long. I can't imagine what Chilton or Haynes is gonna have to do to replicate these. These could be printed, but at massive cost. It's just gonna be impractical. Probably better to donate a thumb drive and an old laptop to the cause so you can search for what you want. I'm also an advocate of OBD2 monitors, which will give you the ability to monitor specific PIDs and view or clear maintenance codes. I've tried a few OBD2 scanners, and while the cheap ones do work, they don't really cover all of the Ford specific PIDs, like the OBD Link MX Plus does. The OBD Link MX Plus is the best one I've used with the most comprehensive set of PIDs specifically for Ford. If you want a much deeper experience for monitoring the systems in your truck, get the OBD Link MX Plus. There is an Amazon link listed in the description and below for your convenience if you're curious. We've entered a strange new world where today's new automotive tech rarely has the full complement of skills and experience to diagnose typical mechanical issues and also software and sensor problems. It really takes a very broad individual in these days of specialization. If you wanna get your truck across the finish line, you might consider picking up some of the service load dealers are swamped and it's taking weeks to address complex repairs. Do the repairs and maintenance that you can, earlier than required and save the tough stuff and recall work for the dealer. 99 bucks for a manual and $140 for an OBD2 monitor might sound expensive until you lose a bunch of time at the dealer handling something minor that you could have done if you just had the right manual in front of you. Step number eight towards having a longer lasting truck is to be nice to your ICE. And of course, ICE stands for internal combustion engine. You can make a real difference in the longevity of your engine by how you treat it. The idea is to reduce undue strain on the engine and drivetrain during normal operating conditions. If you drive it like you stole it, which is heavy acceleration, heavy braking, hard cornering, all of these cause more strain on the drivetrain and engine components. It's the violent change in direction. You moving in one direction and then it's all of that momentum has to be shifted in a different direction. That's what causes the most wear to your drivetrain. I'm not saying that you should drive like a geriatric. Instead, be smooth. You know what the Navy SEALs say, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Smooth out your driving style and extend the life of your truck. This is especially true with hybrid engines like the Power Boost due to some unusual conditions that they can be put in. The following example is me leaving my driveway and going immediately left and downhill. If I'm slow and smooth, I can stay in electric mode the entire time until I begin to climb the hill on the other side. This is the worst thing that you can do to a cold engine. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here I am leaving my driveway, turning left, and immediately it's downhill. So if you can see on the left-hand side of the instrument cluster, there is no engine RPM yet. And I'm gonna turn left here, downhill, a much steeper hill, and I still don't have the engine on. 
The internal combustion engine is still not on. All of this is in EV mode. And so as I get to the bottom of the hill and I start to ascend the opposite side of the hill, all of a sudden, now the internal combustion engine kicks on. Imagine if this was a dead cold engine. That's probably one of the worst things you can do to a dead cold engine is to put it under heavy load like that. Now here's an example of how you should do it. Notice that I already have the engine running. And this is while I'm creeping up the driveway. What I've done is I've kicked the accelerator pedal to start off the ice and get the engine idling. So oil is going up through the galleys. It's coating the cam lobes and just circulating throughout the engine, even though it's not being taxed very hard as it's going downhill. Now I turn left downhill. I'm going to be using some engine braking which is good, and the engine's still running. So this is not about saving fuel by staying on the EV. This is more about understanding the dynamics of how the engine should be used and never ever put an engine into a situation where it requires all heavy load on a dead cold engine like that. Now I'm not saying that you should sit in your driveway and fully warm up the engine before you go anywhere, nope. Just don't make the first revs of the day with a cold engine be under load, like climbing a hill immediately, the first revs of the day. That's a quick way to create excessive wear and shorten your engine's life. Step number nine to keeping your truck running for a long time is to treat her right. I found that the care applied to a vehicle is directly proportional to how good the owner thinks it looks. If the truck looks great, you'll take a lot of pride in the vehicle and put in the work to keep her looking that way. When you spend the time to make it look better, you're usually maintaining the truck more diligently and driving it more carefully until you hit the tipping point, which we all hit with every vehicle. Then it just becomes a truck. You no longer wash it, you quit detailing it, you don't remember when you last changed the oil, or what the next required maintenance is. You display pride at how dirty it is and justify it with statements like, well, it's just a work truck. It won't be long before this truck is found on roadside dead. If you want your truck to last for a long time, keep it looking like new. Mine gets a wash and a vacuum every week, whether it needs it or not, and it always does. And my final suggestion for getting your truck past 300,000 miles is to drive like it's combat. Driving today is more hazardous than ever due to this distracted driving problem. It's a huge issue. Try this experiment. The next time you stop at a stoplight, look around at the drivers next to you. Odds are pretty good that they're going to be checking their phone and probably missing the light. You're not going to get to 300,000 miles on your truck if you depend on the skills and the awareness of the drivers around you. You've got to take it on your own shoulders. You've got to treat driving like urban combat if you want to keep your truck in one piece for several years. I became a better driver when I learned to ride a motorcycle. I took the advanced safety course through the Motorcycle Safety Foundation just staying alive on today's roads, riding a motorcycle required new skills of awareness and anticipation to always give yourself an escape route. I have brought that same level of awareness and proactive space positioning to my driving as well. Be part of the solution by doing your phone stuff like adding your destination address before putting the truck in gear. Up your game by learning defensive driving skills, treat driving, like urban combat. Be alert, be defensive, be predictable, and keep you and your truck in one piece for the long haul. Oh, hi, you're still here? Well, thank you for making it to the end of this video. As you can tell, I'm kind of into this topic because over the years, I've been able to take a few cars into uh, deep service territory, into extended mileage, and Ultimately, what prevented me from taking them further was rust. Rust is one of those things where unless you address it early, you don't have any way to, there's no recourse later on in life unless you start hacking metal out 
and actually welding in brand new metal. You can't just bondo your way to extended life. Now, these are just my 10 ideas for extending the life of your truck. But I'm sure if you watch this to this point, you probably got your own ideas as well. So if you do, please let me know in the comments below. Or if you have any other suggestions for content or any other ideas that you have that you'd like to see me explore, I'd love to hear back from you. In the meantime, thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next video.